Well, it seems everyone survived the Olympics. <laughs> and now we can all look forward with joy and happiness to this convention. <laughs> In the meantime, we will work with the subject of the morning. We all have problems of disposition. And we love disposition very deeply. I remember that friend came to me with many difficulties and admitted that they were extremely selfish and that that might have something to do with it. <laughs> but then they spoke right up and saying, said, if it does, I have no intentions of changing. All I want to do is get rid of the consequences. <laughs> this is human nature. And it is something we all have to face in ourselves and in others. We have to do the best we can to face the inconsistencies that lurk somewhere in the subconscious parts of ourselves. The purpose of philosophy primarily is to help individuals to overcome their own peculiarities. It is that the individual, if he knows enough and is sincere enough, will make the changes necessary to improve his own disposition. If he is not that sincere or does not have that ability, then nature steps in and presents him with a series of complex situations in which the attitudes that he holds that are not right will begin to plague him. He will suffer from consequences, but he will try to avoid the correction of causes. Now, dispositions are variously influenced by circumstances. Most of the influences that affect disposition come from the outside. On the daily pattern of living, we are all upset and worried and frightened, and we are all trying desperately to succeed even if it is at the expense of principles or each other. This counts for most of the compromises that we make. We gradually come to the conclusion that the integrities that we really believe in cannot be applied to the common problems of daily living. We know what we should do, but for one reason or another, we do not feel that we are capable of doing what we should do because it interferes with doing what we want to do. Thus it is that in this world, everyone is more or less a, a servant or a, uh, an employee, a, employee. He is employed by others or he is employed by himself. He can be self-employed and still work for someone else. Uh, the self-employed individual is working constantly to achieve his own purposes and is lo loyal to his chief employer, which is himself. Others are loyal to the office or uh, organization to which they belong, and they give the best service they can. And this loyalty is usually recognized. Actually, there are many ways of looking at a problem. One of the ways to look at it is that if you change the outside, there is no proof that it's going to change the inside. The individual who changes his standard of living, moving upward into a more luxurious environment, does not inevitably become a better person. In fact, he becomes more inclined to be a less sufficient person. The more he has, the more the temptations build. And no amount of external success assures the person of a good life. If, on the other hand, the individual starts from the inside, he can gradually learn that the inside will change the outside into what it should be, if it's given a chance that the best part of the individual's conduct is motivated from within himself. It may be for love of God, 
or love of country, or love of family, the love of principles, service, the love of the sick. All these are unselfish dedications, which coming from the inside enrich the personal life, and also provides these they provide a motive or reason actually for existence. There is really no legitimate reason why we are here if we cannot think of anything except ourselves. So disposition is something that you can work with in children, but if you wait too long, you're almost always going to get into a complicated situation. You cannot spoil a child for the first 15 years of life and then have a well-adjusted child later. You cannot be unpleasant in your relationships with friends, family, and, uh, re and business associates indefinitely and retain their friendship and cooperation. So it is very necessary for us to have a proper background upon which to build a life that is valuable and useful. Of course, in these days, we are much inclined to overlook the religious equation. We are more or less of the belief that you cannot apply religion to trade and industry. That the person cannot live according to the laws of God in a world dominated by the laws of men. To a measure, there may be some excuse for this attitude, but it is more or less of an excuse, basically. Because even in industry and business, integrities are important. And integrities are very important to the person himself and the development of his way of life. So I think we can say that basically a good business career, a good achievement in science or in art and music, investment, banking, law, that all of these specialized fields require a religious factor to maintain their integrities. Remove religion as principles of integrity from any system of thought, and that system will deteriorate and die. Consequently, in human relationships, dispositions must finally come under the dominion of the golden rule. Dispositions must be constantly guided in ways of peace, of happiness, of sincerity. Dispositions must be taught to forgive, must be taught to rise above small personal grievances. All these things are partly possible through a constructive religious relationship with life. The individual who follows the Sermon on the Mount, or the one of the Dialogues of Buddha, and lives according to these rules, will be a good person. And this good person is not only more secure in this world, but faces the unknown future with a better hope. We must gradually weed out that part of our own nature which is destructive. We must get rid of the battlefield in ourselves if we expect to cure war in the world. It is impossible for the individual to break rules without this breakage spreading through society and making life impossible for other people. So in this position we start perhaps in an oriental mood. One of the beginnings of disposition may be to learn how to keep quiet. Because in quietude, we give disposition an opportunity to relax. We also give a greater opportunity in meditation and thoughtfulness for character to assert itself over the passing moods of the moment. We cannot make valuable decisions that are really going to work unless we make them when we are in a state of peace. This is very, very necessary to us. Pythagoras warned parents 
that no parent should ever rebuke a child while the parent themselves is angry. It must be done from a standpoint of principles and the parent must set the example of right attitude in efforts to correct or condition the attitudes of children. So here we come into a very simple problem that people have lost the knack of being quiet. They have lost that Zen relaxation which always associates itself with a firm and balanced judgment. You cannot sit on one end of the scales and expect an honest judgment. You must relax from within yourself and this must be done under a discipline. Every person, even a child in their early teens, should at least once a day have a period of 15 minutes of quietude. A quietude that is not interrupted by television. A quietude that is not interrupted by all kinds of social activities. A simple quietude of being in a state of relaxation. A state in which the person is ready and able to receive the subtle impressions that come from his own soul. If he is not still, the soul cannot speak to him. And if the soul cannot speak to him, he cannot know the spirit. Therefore, to begin with, this position is not something you fight. It is something you outgrow by the simple process of gaining control over attitudes that disturb your mental and emotional equilibrium. So in all problems, the old Christian family had prayer. They said grace at meal and were thankful for the food. They gave very special attention to the children. They read from the Bible. They went to church at least once a week. They lived in an atmosphere dominated by the words of Jesus. Now, this has passed. Now, there's no doubt in the world that in those days there was a great deal of smug hypocrisy. There were people who did not understand or did not really want to grow. Many went to church only to be seen there. But at the same time, there was a general accepted standard of life. Uh, people were supposed to be divided into two general groups, the lower one of which cared for nothing in particular. On the upper part, or upper half, was constantly aware of the responsibility of maturity and tried to do something about it. So here today, we have a world full of war uh, with more and more alarm everywhere. And the individual gets into a kind of panic. He gets his nervous system all disturbed. He gets a little short in his attitudes towards other people. He nurses more grudges. He condemns more politicians and miscellaneous people. He finds something wrong with just about everything. Now, he may be right, but this endless finding of wrong is going to damage him. He must try to understand why things are wrong. He must learn to understand why we do not have any peace in the world. He has to learn why the United Nations can't function. He must learn why the local situation is requiring that everyone put iron bars on his windows and doors. These things are situations and we have to try to understand how they come about and why. And to a measure, why each of us in some degree is responsible for the condition. Because very few people are standing firmly on principles.
And these are the only answers that can ever produce the ends that we desire. So we will hope that from the years of association we have had here, that the individual has gradually found a strengthening of character, that inside the, the resources of self-improvement are greater than they were before, that each person knows a little more about the laws of nature, knows to experience a little bit more about the will of God, and most of all has learned by possibly bitter experience what happens to individuals, groups, or nations that fall for arrogance and selfishness. All of these considerations help the person to be self-controlling and self-directing. So when you sit down for the little quiet time, the problem always is to observe that this quietness depends for its expression and its completion upon a certain basic constitutional attitude. The person who is basically kind will find a philosophy of kindness evolving within himself which will protect him from many evils. He will find also that this kindness spreads through society and that others inspired by his attitudes will try to do a little better themselves. So all the way along through the problems of life we have to keep a definite contact with the interior soul factor in ourselves. We have to be sure in our natures that the best in us is guiding the rest of us, that the leadership is in the hands of the most able part of our own being. As we approach a political situation, we are not all convinced that the candidates are what they ought to be or that the election is going to produce any very great difference in our general condition. We are not aware or not certain that leadership as we know it is sufficient, is dependable, and is dominated by unselfish idealism. Now go to ourselves for a moment. What part of ourselves have we elected to office as the guardian and guide of our lives? From what level of our own internal mechanism are we fashioning a philosophy which is to protect us, guide us, and inspire us through the years of our material existence? Are we allowing the best part of ourselves to govern the rest? Or are we constantly hiding the best because it interferes with the things we want to do? The labors of self-centeredness, selfishness, ambition, and revenge are not part of a message that comes from the best part of ourselves. It comes from a level that is not fit to govern. It is a level that if it does get into the seat of government, will be arrogant, destructive, hateful, and abusive. Therefore, if we must make a life decision, what is the highest concept of life that we can imagine? What is our idea of a truly mature person as we try to contemplate upon such a person in the act of meditation? When we are trying to decide which part of our own natures is the best to lead the rest, we will come to some rather interesting decisions, experiences. We have to learn as people learn that if we want good government, the governed must be reliable and intelligent. If we want the government of our personal lives to be responsible, we must therefore make it possible for that level of government to be in office and stay there. This means that the person has to defend the best part of himself if he wishes to benefit by its contributions. 
the possibility of achieving internal security without keeping a, a pact of relationship with the divine part of ourselves is impossible. Now what is this divine part of ourselves going to do? It is going to do very largely that which the embodiment and personification of that divine self in the power and principle of Jesus Christ is to be the leader of our lives. If we belong to another religion, that's fine, because every worthwhile religion has had the exactly the same attitude on this subject, namely, that if we want to achieve security and peace, we must keep the rules of life. Now, one of the things we learn, and which we are taught from childhood in Bible schools and other places, is forgiveness that we must learn to forgive instead of revenge, that we must learn to be kind instead of critical, that we cannot afford to have so many friends that we can afford one enemy, especially if we have caused that enemy ourselves. So for everywhere in relationships, we realize the words, blessed are the peacemakers that every one of us in every walk of life should try in every way that we can to keep the peace and in so doing inspire others to do the same in the raising of children particularly the, the keeping of the peace the maintain, maintenance of a family relationship that is kindly, generous, sympathetic this is the main success of a home and without it, we don't have a home. Yet today, thousands, millions of homes are involved in constant conflicts over matters that should never have entered into the situation at all. So in meditation, we try to straighten out something. We try to substitute an inner control for this outward flare-up that is a serious detriment to everyone concerned. Now another problem is of trying to understand these matters has to do with the transformation of grievances. A grievance is something that an individual will nurse for the rest of their lives. It is easy apparently to forget anything good that ever happened to us but never forget anything that was unfortunate. So we therefore have the problem of trying to understand why things happen. If we have no philosophy of life, or are stark materialists or devotees of the Darwinian theory, we have no problem, because life has no purpose. And each individual is supposed to get along as comfortably as possible until he fades away. But if by some chance we really believe that we are thoughtful, there is nothing to prevent thoughts from being tested. In the ancient mystery systems of Greece and Egypt and India, no one was permitted into the temples for initiatory rites until they had been thoroughly tested. And this is still true in esoteric Buddhism in Japan, China, and Korea, Tibet. The individual must prove an achievement of internal integrity. He cannot simply go in as an individual full of faults and wait for the religion to save him. He is not actually acceptable into any school of mysticism until he has already corrected the more obvious and tantalizing faults that he may suffer from. So in Egypt they were tested, and in Greece. And let us not think for a moment that these tests were superficial. These tests did not consist of a ritual in which the individual simply watched somebody else go through a ceremony. These tests were long, complicated, dangerous, and in many cases failure was almost inevitable. There was just that little spark of possibility 
that the individual would superimpose upon his common nature a higher nature long enough to pass the test. On many occasions, in Egypt particularly, those who took the initiations and did not pass them did not again appear in the world. They were not injured, but they became part of a great system that took care of the mortuary rites of the dead. There was nothing funny, foolish, or superficial about these rites. They were real. One Roman emperor who was good enough, apparently, to be given the opportunity was attacked by masked priests. Their purpose was to reveal to him the uselessness of violence. But he did not pass the test, and in his failure killed one of the priests by accident. Therefore, these were not just wordy rituals. You didn't pay five dollars initiation fee or something, and all went well. You had to earn it. Now, those rights have more or less disappeared from our world. But instead of rights, we have riots. Instead of the rights in the temple, we have the riots in the marketplace. The whole world has suddenly become a sanctuary for the testing of human character. We are all faced with the same tests that were found in the caverns under Sais and Memphis. We are still being tested as to the integrities of our inner lives. And unless we pass the test, we have to continue to take the examinations until we do. But once we have transcended a weakness of character, once we have departed from our natural human emotions to contemplate the mystery of divine nature, we can do these things with considerable ease. It is not an impossible task. Let us therefore think of this world not just as a schoolroom, as Paracelsus termed it, but as a mystery temple, a place where individuals are tested. Now one of the reasons why the old system faded away was become, because it became ever increasingly necessary for those leaders who invisibly guided humanity through its Im Im immediate infancy realized that sometime the child had to grow up, that it could not be protected forever by the presence of divine powers, that it could not depend upon angels and archangels and the seraphim to guide it through the mysteries of life. The child was growing up. It had to stand on its own feet. It had to make its own integrities. It had to prove its own strength. It had to go out and win a victory over the weaknesses which might still lurk within its composition. So the t initiations today are in daily life. The family squabble, the business squabble, the professional jealousies, uh, the corruption of office, all these things are problems that the individual has to correct. And everyone in all walks of life who is breaking the law must take the consequences. Now most people are beginning to be rather aware of these consequences. We are beginning to recognize that we are not living the way we should. And we are also beginning to realize that at least in part it's our own fault and not the fault of some mysterious over political structure that is going to take care of us. We are each of us dependent upon our own integrities. So if we view this life we live as a test of character, we know when we win it and we know when we lose it and we also know when we try to avoid it. We find that avoidance is nothing. It helps no way. Whatever it was we tried to uh, avoid is still sitting on our doorstep later. We must achieve certain things, and it must be the victory of character over disposition. It is not possible for the individual to continually function in a weather of changing attitudes 
he has got to begin to strengthen his purposes, strengthen his life, and make himself a, a useful instrument in a plan. Now, if this was, as some people still believe, if this was the only chance we have to live, if this is the only life we will ever have, and is the only one we ever have had, it might be a little different. But we have to recognize the fact that, the, that uh, what we accomplish now, if it is right, contributes to permanent growth. If it is wrong, remains an obstacle to growth until the, the wrong is righted. So it is very important, as it was in the ancient days, for the individual to enter the temple with the full realization of integrity. In the Iliocenian mysteries in Greece, uh, the initiation of a candidate was the final statement that that person was right. The temple turned down the rich and the powerful. When one man was falsely accused of a crime, which was to be held against him. He asked to be submitted to the test of the mysteries. He asked that the priest who sat in judgment should try his case and decide whether he was worthy to be initiated into the Iliocenian rites. If he was found worthy by the committee that examined him, this was sufficient to assure that no one else outside of the temple would ever have the right to condemn him or criticize him or doubt him for that incident. If, however, as in the case of Constantine, the emperor, he was not sure of his own integrities, he went to Elysius to be initiated, hesitated, and went away without entering the temple because he knew in his heart the crimes he had committed. Therefore, in the temple mysteries, the final test of preparedness was a kind of examination in which the life of the person was taken under the most careful scrutiny, sometimes requiring weeks or months of research to decide. But if accepted, it meant that the common faults from which the average person suffers had been already corrected. Then the final correction took place in the right itself, where the initiate to be was faced with the realization that in any emergency of life in which character was involved, he must be willing to die rather than to commit an ignoble deed. He, death before dishonor was written in very large letters in the mystery system. No individual was allowed uh, to uh, avoid or evade the fact that his principles had to be strong enough to carry him in peace, integrity, friendlessness, affection, and regard through the most terrible emergencies of life. Well, people say that was all long ago and can't do those things today. Well, it probably can't. But you can get into the same problems and you can have the same miserable time trying to get out of them. You find that we have to face in this modern civilization the future according to the light of the ancient wisdom. If we don't, we're going to be very unhappy and our homes will fail and our children will be no comfort to us. So we must work all the time we can. Now, how do we do some of this? Well, we have a problem that most people have trouble with, and that's memory. It's very hard to forget grievances. They keep coming back and annoying us. And there is no way in which a grievance can be forgotten unless senility sets in or the individual goes under psychotherapy and in, it had it hypnotized out of his conscious memory. Even then, however, he's liable to slip back. But what is he going to do 
with a problem that he has hated, that he has mourned over, that he has fretted about, and that he has been disillusioned about. And one person came to me and said they had not spoken to their own sister for 20 years on a grudge. And uh, I asked her what the grudge was about, which she said, as the truth is known, I think you've all forgotten. <laughs> Nothing remains but the grudge. I know I've got the hater. Well, this type of thing is not uncommon, and sometimes it goes to church and doesn't pay any attention to that. It feels that it is perfectly right in its attitude. But it's very difficult, in fact impossible, to simply say, I didn't like this person, now I have to like them. I, because my conscience tells me I should like them. Well, there is another end to this, which nature provides. And this is what is commonly called in the world philosophy. And philosophy is the reconciler of opposites. It is that power that makes the unreasonable suddenly become factual. It is also that by means of which we can transform any incident of our lives from a tragedy to a lesson. It is actually sometimes possible, I've actually heard people express it, that an injury that was done to them was the best thing that ever happened to them because it made them think, made them try to find a solution, made them believe that they had to make certain changes in themselves. A man was a heavy drinker and he carried it like a gentleman for a long time. Then one day he had a serious fight and brutally beat up his own wife. This suddenly he woke up. So this incident, which was a terrible incident, and one that was very hard for the wife to survive, was the end of the grievance of nature in himself. He stopped drinking, he realized what had happened, and sent his life to self-improvement which ended ultimately in a better condition for all concerned. So thing that happens that, is, that are wrong, if we accept that wrongness and realize it and take it as a test rather than as an unfair situation, whether it's fair or unfair, it has to be solved by consciousness on a higher level than the consciousness on which the grudge exists. We can't store it, uh, sword, uh, settle it or destroy the grudge on its own level. We have to rise above it. We have to see that there is a lesson behind every disaster. There is a great principle involved in every catastrophe. It's hard to realize this. And sometimes our human judgments do fail. We can't quite handle it. But at the same time, it does help in a great many moderate cases of hatreds to realize that they can be changed and that out of an a situation that has been an annoyance, there can arise a great advancement of our own inner development, that we become wiser, greater, better, and more kindly as the result of a tragic situation of some kind. While Pythagoras was teaching at Crotona, he had among his disciples one young man who was what we would call today slow of learning. He never seemed to catch on to anything correctly. He, he misunderstood and he tried desperately hard, but he couldn't understand or, or take on the heavy elements of a philosophical discipline. And finally one day Pythagoras became so annoyed at him that he made a sharp rebuke of his stupidity. The boy reached into his girdle, took out a dagger, and killed himself in the presence of Pythagoras. Pythagoras took the oath on the body of the boy that never again while he lived would he criticize any living thing. Now these are lessons which are part of the old mystery system, things that we have to learn the hard way, but the learning of them is a great benefit. And as we become less and less addicted to defense of unworthy causes, we have more energy, we have more vitality, we are able to accomplish more. There is nothing that drops into us into neurasthenia more easily 
than a constantly negative attitude on something. Criticism ends in a definite psychosis, and it becomes chronic, and it will gradually result in early senility of the involved person. It is a waste of energy. The only way, use of energy that is not a waste is kindness. Otherwise, it is a loss for all concerned. Out of kindness comes all the good that we can do for ourselves and each other. So the problem of getting around this business of dispositions is to recognize the disposition not as a disaster but as a challenge. And also, for once and for all, get over the idea that our disposition has been adversely affected by other people. Other people can do what they can to make us uncomfortable sometimes, but they cannot reach us if we are solidly established in principles within ourselves. We can take whatever they say and take it in kindness. Or we can take the losses that they bring or the cruelties which they circulate with the realization that the only answer is, as uh, Edwin Markham pointed out, the only answer to the cruelty of another is say, simple love. The other person may reject it, but that is the only emotion we can afford for ourselves. Otherwise, we get into the same problem, and there's nothing more miserable than the circumstance of people all to blame worrying about their problems. Now, if, uh, in the devotional theories of antiquity and of the Orient today, the, uh, the religious life, uh, the life of discipline, has to have certain symbols. If we want to live better, think better, and be better, it becomes necessary for us to begin doing better things. We have to give expression to the part of us that we really want to use. The individual with all the resolution in the world to be kindly doesn't have the full fulfillment of this resolution until he is kind to something or for someone. Therefore, the individual must begin to manifest in daily life the symptoms of the things that he should be doing. Now, a great deal of uh, unhappiness, misery, and conflict comes from people who are actually not using faculties and allowing them to more or less decay. The individual who does not have a well-planned program of constructive activity is apt to fall back into destructive attitudes. We have to have a daily outlet, a constant outlet for something that satisfies the inner life. Now, one of the course, we have a number of possible selections. One of the most interesting and improving probably is art. Art is a magnificent way of expressing beauty. And all that is noble in man's nature is beauty. And the beauty is one of the three primary aspects of deity. Everything that deity creates is beautiful in itself. The universe is beautiful. The flower is beautiful. Strange creatures that we do not understand are still beautiful also. And the world that we can create is one of beauty. And we can express our love of deity by serving beauty and producing beautiful things. Beauty, therefore, has a redeeming factor. Uh, Plotinus, on, in his essay on the beautiful, points this out very clearly. That next to the very breath of divinity, uh, the presence of beauty is a benediction. That it is something that should always be thought about and cultivated. Therefore, every individual should variously attempt to beautify his life, his mind, his emotions, his home, and whatever elements come under his control. The neglect of beauty, the neglect of self-respect for order, symmetry, pattern, all these things disintegrate our integrities or reduce them. 
And once we have begun to slip into negatives, we can slide very easily the rest of the way. So one thing we must do is to find ways of expressing the new emotions and feelings that we have developed. If we want to do something, if we really love humanity, we will go out and help someone. We won't just simply do the same old things we've always done and feel that the attitude is sufficient. It is not. No virtue is really a proven virtue until it is used to do something that brings joy, comfort, peace, or security to others. Every bit of selfishness, therefore, violates the rules of integrity. So we have all kinds of choices. There are things, music is a good choice, art, the dance, uh, architecture, photography, all kinds of art, hobbies, crafts, uh, and all types, ceramics, and wood carving, fabrics, all the things in this world which imply beauty and are made from a conscientious desire to express something within ourselves that is going to be beautiful and produce happiness. We have here in the library a large collection of folk material created by primitive people. We may or may not think these primitive people are great artists, but if we go through the products of the, the, these persons, most of whom cannot read or write, have never had a lesson at all, have only used little local things that they have available to themselves. From this kind of talent has arisen works of art that equal anything done by Michelangelo or Leonardo da Vinci. Art is the expression of the longing for beauty within the self, is fulfilled by the expression of the best that we know, trying to express something that is locked within our own souls, and we are trying to get it out. And it is very important that everyone who wants to improve character should find some way of doing things that make life warmer, more gentle, and will create appreciation by others. Maybe the appreciation of others is simply a kind of little human reaction that we enjoy, but it's not too seriously bad to be appreciated if we do something worth appreciating. It all rests with us. So wherever we want to uh, find a more warm and gentle and kindly way of life, we must try to build it in to our daily happenings so that in little ways we become exponents of these uh, moods of more gentle thoughtfulness. After you go a ways in uh, Eastern religion, perhaps, or in practically any of the esoteric schools, either of the ancient or modern world, we also pass beyond the period of meditation into something else. We pass gradually into the internal experience of universal citizenship. We suddenly realize that we are not little ants of some kind tied to a small planet. We are not just something that's floating around in space on a molehill. There is much to more to life than this. As we begin to unfold our own inner resources, we discover that the universe inside of us is more vast and more wonderful than the one outside of ourselves. If we go deeply enough into self, self we will also discover the deepest parts of, in, of infinite space. Within the individual is a great universal mystery, a mystery that we were created to solve, a, me, a way of life which we must find and live with to fulfill our destiny. And if we do not pay any attention to this now, if we feel that it's much more important to buy a few stocks and bonds and buy a bigger swimming pool, then we will come back sometime and may have to swim in the ruins of our own swimming pool. Actually, 
this tremendous universal experience is something it suddenly reminds us that we are part of a divine purpose that each of us was predestined and foreordained to a ministry of universal redemption we are here to do things we are here to make the world more beautiful we are here to prove that love is real and that it is not subject to all kinds of temptations and ulterior motives we are here to become harmless and in being harmless gain the greatest possible strength the strength of infinite virtue so we have to try to get this idea of citizenship into our system if we decide or resolve that we can't change ourselves in this life then we have to recognize the fact that what we cannot do will be done to us we will change if we have to pass through the, the grave and into another embodiment in order to change that is the way it will be but change we will and sometimes a new life is a new chance to get away for a while from all the mistakes we made in the past but the fact that we get away from them doesn't mean we've cured them so our new embodiment is burdened with a lot of unfinished business and this unfinished business is perhaps most clearly defined as uh, as evidenced by disposition temperament and character the, that basic something in ourselves that seems to move us in one direction or, in or, or another is actually in large part that voice of unfinished business which we have brought forward from the past now we've brought forward a lot of nice things too we've not come down through the hundreds of embodiments that lead to the present time without accomplishing something there are a great many very gross failures that we have corrected there are nice things that we have done which are not forgotten by time or space there are all kinds of new opportunities and we bring to each embodiment the mellowed experience of previous life the incidents we have forgotten but the rules that have been kept and broken we remember and these rules we either keep or break again so each person who really wants to get somewhere must realize that that temper fit which may be gone in a couple of hours is a little scar in the substance of character it is simply something that shouldn't be there and if this is allowed to develop into a tendency to have these moods whenever it seems convenient that little scar becomes a deep wound and the inner life of the individual is not going to forget it the inner life is scarred by habits and practices which have been allowed to accumulate without correction so we come into the world and from the time we are two years old we are fretful we are not a particularly pleasant or happy baby and as soon as we get a little older we discover that with a tantrum we can get what we want and we've learned that from the past and we have forgotten however what the temp what the temper fit did to us we have forgotten the misery that is caused the tragedy that it brought into previous lives all that came forward this time is the uncorrected tendency to it it, it, that impulse to do it again that impulse to uh, do as we please at the expense of others and this as if it's allowed to grow will gradually infect the life as it infected the one before perhaps the parents come into this a little bit we help to pay for our own mistakes by helping to other people who get into the problem of making mistakes themselves a wise thoughtful and fully responsible parent seeing dispositional peculiarities that are adverse uh, to a good and happy life can always start in and work with it a little bit try to find out how to handle it try to pre present the child with new incentives uh, to get over these indulgences in childish feudings and so on 
Maybe the parent can't do it, but there's a good chance they can if they start early enough. But if the parent goes merrily on its way and never pays any attention to the children until they're 16 or 18 years old and suddenly wakes up that, and finds he's got delinquents, this is karma. This is the fact of life. And somewhere in the world we have to learn that all of the things that come as responsibilities must be met in full or we will have to pay again. So every attitude in the person, character, and disposition which is contrary to intelligent, dedicated growth, and contrary to the improvement of the entire life cycle, will ultimately be the source of grief or distress to us in our later days. We cannot escape these things. They're there. And they will haunt us unless we correct them. Now, this may make life look awfully heavy. It's not nice to think that we go to school all the time. Well, it depends a lot on what the school is. It is said that before he made a slight mistake, Adam attended in the school of the angels. And that uh, when he wasn't a very apt pupil, he caused difficulties to all concerned. But actually... The na nature's education is not hard. It is not a brutal thing. It is not something which says, Thou shalt not forever. Nature's way of educating us is to give us a beautiful world in which to live. Nice people to get along with, if we are reasonably patient. Opportunities for all kinds of constructive experiences. Abilities to develop talents and resources within ourselves, the right to choose to grow, the right to grow like the flower in the field naturally, because it is its nature to grow. It is the nature of the human being to grow. It is the nature of the human being like the flower to be beautiful. It is the nature of the human being to be kind and generous and thoughtful. All these things are part of the beauty of life not some hard rule in which we are going to be punished if we do wrong. The more thought is, we will be rewarded if we do right. And if we have troubles, it's because we have caused them, not because nature has wished them upon us. It is because we have not chosen to be happy in a world in which happiness is possible. A happiness, at least a very complete contentment, by means of which we can live a life that is useful, constructive, meaningful, and do all the better things we want to do without falling victim to the negative aspects of our own disposition. The only way we can really overcome a bad dispositional fault is in ourselves and not permitting ulterior motives to focus upon that fault. In old days, they... Uh, always thought that demons and evil spirits were tempting human beings to make mistakes. We've kind of gotten over that point of view, however. We've realized finally that it's not necessary to have demons to help us make mistakes. We can do a good job of it all by ourselves. But we still like to blame something. And when it reached the point where we couldn't blame the devil and we couldn't blame demons, that were supposed to lurk under the front doorsteps of the houses. Then we had to find someone else. We had to have a scapegoat. There had to be some reason why we did wrong. And it just couldn't be ourselves that's to blame. So in the development of a scapegoat, we have gradually developed the process of transferring the causes of our discontent to those around us. We're going to blame one relative for one thing and another for something else. We are going to avoid very carefully the recognition that the ability to succeed in spiritual matters rests entirely in our own keeping. The parable of Jesus walking on the waters has been used in a number of metaphysical systems as a representation of the Christ spirit in man walking upon the storm and walking where no ordinary person can walk 
and that uh, in walking upon the waves we, it means that the enlightened soul can walk upon the corruptions of life without drowning, without being controlled or directed by the infirmities that arise in our daily living. So we can all walk upon the waters of our own problems. We can say to the oceans, be still, and they will be still. We can say to our own hearts, be still, and know that I am God. These things can happen. Until they happen, we're all going to be in trouble. And uh, it's too bad if we can't grow enough to make sure that we get rid of most of our troubles in this life at least. Maybe there was an old saying that was quite prevalent in India and among some of the schools that originated in India, that when the individual really de was determined to do right, all his old bad karma was dumped on him at once. <laughs> because it seems that no one puts the rocks in the way of someone who isn't going anywhere. But the moment you go somewhere, you have to use resources uh, that have strength behind them. If you want to suffer, you can stay just as you are and enjoy it if you can, and some do. But if you want to grow, you're going to be forced to face issues that you have previously carefully avoided. You are going to have to do things that you really did not want to do. So it is an idea that the moment you make a dedication, your troubles increase. This is not true. Dedication never caused a problem. Uh, but dedication can come into complex relationships with big problems that you yourself have already caused. So if you want to grow, you have to have growing pain of some kind. Every child has it. They go through nervous tensions and all kinds of things trying to grow up. When we want to grow from a modern, present, immature level of life and thinking to a higher one, we have to face challenge. We have to discover that there is in ourselves something that doesn't seem to want to grow that it wants to live its own peaceful life. In the famous Wagnerian opera of Siegfried, Fafner the giant, who was rewarded by Wotan by give, being given the treasures of the Nibelung, went into a cave and buried the treasures. And then Fafner the giant uh, changed himself into a dragon and went to sleep at the entrance to the cave to guard his treasure forever. When Siegfried came along, the hero, uh, to challenge this and to, to force the reluctant dragon to give up the treasures, the sleepy dragon just said, let me sleep, let me sleep. Well, may, many people, guarding their own troubles and their own misfortunes and their own weaknesses, when challenged, just say, leave me alone, let me rest, I don't want to work. I don't want to change. I just want other people to do what I want them to. <laughs> so this way, this let me sleep attitude means leave me with the weaknesses I possess, but take away from me all the punishments for them. This can't be done. But as uh, I remember several uh, Hindu metaphysicians I knew years ago pointed out to me, namely that one of the signs of healthy growth is the fact that you're expected to be better than you were yesterday. Each day must be an advance or this impulse of growth turns on itself and sours. The real part of growth, once you assume it, once you decide to live a better life, you have to stay with it because if you fail, it was worse than it was before. But this victory is there. We are all here because in each of us is the eternal flame of divine life. We are here because we are sparks of a divinity that is eternal. We are here because that spark in us is clothed with a series of vestments, which we call sometimes bodies and sometimes 
uh, veils. We have a, not only the spirit, but we have a soul nature, which is equivalent in the West to the Buddhist concept of Bodhi, the enlightener within ourselves, the soul. We have a mind of two levels and stratas, a mind of creative uh, power and a mind of repetitive powers. We have emotions, which are both ideal and material. And we have a physical body, which is not a principle itself, but is a receptacle of all of these higher principles that function through it. So we live here with a visible body, which is the tail end appendage of our complete natures. We live here with this inside power, the power of feeling, the power of thinking, the power of believing. And we have a tremendous energy equivalent with which to work. We have been given a body that is a very wonderful thing. One article I saw not long ago says that the human heart, uh, by testing and checking, is, uh, is able to outlast and outlive seven expensive automobiles, each of which has been driven a hundred thousand miles. The heart would take that as a, just an ordinary job. This heart within us is unbelievable. It is something that gives us the right to make better decisions, the right to grow, the right to be wonderful people, the right to breathe, the right to have friends, to see nature, to do all the things that would make beauty. And yet now we are beginning to realize from psychotherapy and uh, various psychological conditioning systems that we can cut down the endurance of the heart by nearly half by negative thinking alone. Criticism sickens the heart. Pleasure, joy, reward, gratitude strengthens the heart. So even the body has to pay for the mistakes of the thing that lives in it. And because of this we don't realize that a large part of the vitality of life is wasted trying to avoid work. Next we have the emotional nature with its various factors and elements to consider. We have emotions that run all the way from idealistic spiritual convictions to the most corporeal passions and fears and hates. The emotional nature is also, however, a beautiful thing in itself and it carries the karma very largely that results from the failure of the power that lives in that body. So the emotions, if they're allowed to run without control, and in all sorts of extravagances and luxuriousnesses, it becomes a problem in which the person finally kills themselves with their own luxuries. Uh, we read in the papers every day of some wealthy person who passes out in his fifties from exhaustion. This type of emotional pressure and the corruptions and intemperances of emotional excess destroy life and also result in a lot of bad karma in most cases. Then we have the mental nature. The mental nature is rather heroic. It likes to be very self-centered. It likes to think how great it is, how great and important the individual is who has privilege to have this particular mind. And the result of that, it goes off into all kinds of misuses of mental energy, all the way from black magic up to exploitation, war, ambitions that lead to the destruction of values. All these things we have to fight with or do something about. We really don't fight them because there's nothing that wins a victory over emotions, thoughts, attitudes, energy fields, and all these things. Nothing wins a greater victory more rapidly than quietude. At peace with self is the most important thing the person can achieve. And in order to be at peace with themselves, they have to respect themselves. They have to know that what they are doing and how they are doing it is acceptable in the sight of that which is within themselves. 
They also have to realize that they must fulfill the burdens and responsibilities which they have assumed in life. Not to regard them as burdens, but to regard them as opportunities. Every problem that confronts us is an opportunity to grow. It is a chance to be bigger now than we were yesterday. It is a chance to solve something. And perhaps most of all, it is a chance to learn something. When Francis Bacon, as the principal exponent and founder of the modern scientific approach to knowledge, pointed out on one occasion that there are three or four ways in which knowledge can be accumulated. And the most important of these is experience. Experience can be anything from the farmer in the field to the technician in the laboratory. Experience is the privilege of knowing for certainty that various causes have inevitable effects. Experiences tell us what we can do and what we cannot do. And all of the great scriptures of the world were based upon the experiences of prehistoric human beings or perhaps visitors from larger and more friendly worlds. But experience is the great teacher. Experience will to tell us when our stomachs are not being treated properly. Our experience will tell us when we offend our children. Experience will tell us when we vote for the wrong candidate. Of course, this is a little intangible because they don't always have a candidate worth working, voting for. <laughs> but we do the best we can. This is one of the intangible uncertainties that Bacon, I think, would probably say requires laboratory research. That is, they must keep on experimenting until they find out that which is good. But in all ways, we have ways of growing and learning, and we do have ways of getting away from the parts of ourselves that we can't get along with very well. We can get our minds off of ourselves. The individual who is all wrapped up in himself has been described as a very small package, and that's what he is. It is perfectly possible for us to become so much more interested and involved in important things that we have no longer time to spend all our energy trying to please our own egos. It's not necessary for us to uh, just go along doing things that don't mean much, but there's always ways in which we can learn to make better use of the powers that we have. Uh, we can get our minds off of ourselves by involving our minds in educational projects. Now in education there's a, a little question as to what constitutes education. We're not entirely sold on educators at the moment. I remember noting in a paper, I don't remember where, and I'm not going to be quoted, but the substance is good just the same, that a certain university professor wrote a textbook for his class, and the work had so much profanity and pornography in it that it was not fit to be published. Now, this is something in education. But we do know there are certain forms of education that can always have a certain utility. Any education that brings people together is important. And one of these is language. The more we can think and understand other people, the sooner our problems will become less. So if we want to do something, to learn something, learn how to talk with a neighbor from another land. Try to understand life, and having learned some of the language, maybe go and visit the country. This is an opportunity to open doors of friendship. There is nothing competitive about learning another language. We either have aptitude or we don't. But whatever it is, we can do something to bring each other together in uh, some form of compatible relationships. Another very interesting form of, of work, naturally, is the study of comparative religion. If we study comparative religion, we do not need to take the, uh, the attitude that we have to be the center of the stage. Comparative religion should help us all to have a better bank 
of strength references by which we can direct our own activities. By comparative religion, we can heal in our own hearts the wounds that competitive nations are not able to heal geographically in these days. We are getting a very bad misunderstanding of religions due to the fact that most people in various countries are not living them. There is no such a thing as a religion that really believes in hate. There are a great many that practice it, but the actual fact of every religion is that the final end of man is to make peace with humanity and find final emancipation through the love of deity. These kind of things help to give us something a little more important to think about than our own grievances. Then we can develop various service fields that will help. Broken homes need someone to help them. The working families need someone to watch children. All kinds of opportunities arise to be of service. And an hour of service is more important than a month of fretting. A little effort to do things that some way are an echo of this character within us. Giving the best part of ourselves an opportunity to reveal its own natural gentleness, kindness, and affection. If we can do some of these things, life will be a lot easier for all concerned. And if enough people do these types of things, there'll be no more wars. Wars are merely nourishing hates and ambitions and selfishness. Wars are built up by false values which are negative and produce nothing that is any good. To just have one moment of gentle insight and understanding will bring more peace to this world than a world of wars. We have to find the healing areas and in every individual the best part of himself, the deepest part of himself is also his great physician. Many of the maladies of today and of other days are simply the result of thoughts and emotions that have gone sour and have afflicted the body as well as the mind and emotions. Many, many psychiatrists are working all the time with people who really are destroying themselves by nursing grievances. Get out of this habit entirely. Decide definitely that you're going to look back and remember some of the good things that happened. And if you sincerely believe you can't find a good thing somewhere in the past, it's high time you made up one right now and got to work on it. If you haven't any good memories now, make some so you can have them in the future. But get rid entirely as much as humanly possible of every negative attitude and get rid of trying to pass on responsibilities to other people. You will find other people will be more friendly and you will like them better if you don't keep on accusing them of being responsible for your faults. That's liable to prove unpleasant to the individual you are accusing. Keep these things straight and most of all Start out by forgiving your enemies, being sincere to your friendships, and to live as far as possible mentally, emotionally, and physically without ulterior motives, dedicated to the fact that we're here to learn, to love, and to live. And by following these rules, we'll do pretty well in this world in spite of the troubles that we find around us. Well, thank you very much, folks. That's all I've got to do.